You all have noticed so far that sometimes I talk energy, sometimes I talk power, and it gets a little confusing. And so at this point, we're going to be a little more precise, and you'll forgive me for slipping from one to the other from time to time. Uh, so we're going to talk about energy spectral density and power spectral density in this uh, module. And we'll be talking about, in particular, the autocorrelation function uh, as important in the formal definitions of these spectra. So uh, we'll start, start with uh, um, energy and power signals. How are they different? And all of this, by the way, is covered in these sections of our textbook from Scalar. So energy function, I really talked about it already when I was talking about Parseval's function and talking about spectrum in the first place. And so I talked then about the interpretation of the results as energy. And I said we can think of this function in time as being like a voltage which is going through a uh, unit resistance. And in that case, when I take the integral over time from minus infinity to infinity of time uh, and a, of a voltage squared, I'm getting the energy. And that's why uh, this interpretation of, of energy. And um, for instance, I could define for a communication system an energy per bit. So suppose that my function is not you know, going from minus infinity to infinity. It could be a rectangle, for instance. But whatever it is, it's got some finite support in the time domain. And so it goes from the minus time of a bit divided by 2. So Tb is the time duration of a bit that's going to be transmitted. And then the energy in a bit would just be the integral uh, of the um, voltage squared uh, for this, this uh, bit waveform that I'm sending. Um, I can also define the autocorrelation function for this uh, any, any function of time. So the definition of an autocorrelation function for a time domain signal is that I have an integral from minus infinity to infinity of the signal with itself uh, with some time delay. And the time delay tau is what remains. And so um, this is um, taking a function in time and then you take the exact same function in time with some lag. So we assume that there's some lag between these two copies of the same function. And I take these two copies and I multiply them by one another, and I take the integral under the product. And this is the definition of the autocorrelation function. And we have, um, well, we'll see some properties of the autocorrelation function, but this is just the definition. It's a little different from the convolution integral. There's no flipping. There's just the sliding and the lag. So let's take this uh, autocorrelation function, in particular the autocorrelation of energy signals, and let's look at what could be some properties that we can easily derive from these, uh, this definition of the autocorrelation function. So the first property is that the um, autocorrelation function is symmetric um, around the axis of tau equals zero. And that just comes directly from this definition. So if I just uh, replace this equation with minus tau, uh, change the variable, um, I'm going to get the, the same exact expression. So uh, symmetric about tau equals zero. Second property is that the maximum value occurs at the origin, which is sort of very intuitive. When I line these two copies of the function up with exactly aligned, exactly aligned, well then the area under the curve is going to be the largest. Uh, so um, uh, this is written mathematically by this expression that um, the value at zero is greater than all of the other values. Of course we admit the possibility that the function is, um, uh, excuse me, is complex, so I'm going to use uh, this to mean the modulus. Now, the next thing I do is I take the Fourier transform. This is like a function of time. I call it tau, but it's like a function of time. And I can take uh, the Fourier transform. And the Fourier transform, I'm going to give a name. And the name I give to this Fourier transform is the energy spectral density. So ESD is, by definition, the Fourier transform pair. And it goes right back to what I said earlier about Parseval's theorem. It's basically the same thing. Uh, but here I just give the definition that the Fourier transform pair gives the energy spectral density. And the last property is, of course, if I put tau equals zero in this expression, that I will get uh, the x squared here, and this is by definition the energy of the signal. So the autocorrelation function 
at the origin is just equal to the energy of the signal. Uh, again, just to uh, place this with the previous discussion, uh, this is the energy spectral density, which previously I think I called E of omega. So I'm going to show you now that these two things are equivalent, that we say in Sklar that we take the definition of the autocorrelation function and the inverse, excuse me, the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function gives us the energy spectral density. And before I said the energy spectral density was uh, defined by uh, the Fourier transform of the signal. So, previous slide, E of omega is equal to F of omega divided by 2 pi. That's what I said. And in this Sklar representation, he says uh, it's just the um, autocorrelation function, it's Fourier transform. So are these two things the same? I want to convince you that they are indeed the same. So let's go through it. So I take the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function. What is the autocorrelation function? Well, it's this integral. What is a Fourier transform? Well, Fourier transform is an integral. So I take an integral here. Um, inside of this, that's just the definition of R of tau, right? But I want to take the Fourier transform, so I take the integral of that, and now I have e to the minus j omega t. Definition, Fourier transform. Now I get clever, and I say, well, I'm going to uh, change the order of the integration. So instead of having dt being the first integration, I'm going to make the d tau the first integration. So just changing the order of the integrals, double integral, you can do that. Um, and what that means, well, they're both minus infinity, infinity, so it doesn't look very different. But now I got the d tau on the inside, the dt on the outside. That means that the f of t, f of t is not a function of tau, right? So it doesn't have to be inside of that inner integral. So the f of t I pull out, and what's left, I concentrate on that, and I look at, hmm, here I got something that has to do with tau. Now I'm going to have to deal with that, that tau. And, and I think, well, I'm going to multiply and divide by the same thing. So I introduce e to the j omega t, and then I multiply here by e to the minus j omega t. So when I multiply them together, I get 1. So that's like totally OK. I'm multiplying by 1 now. But here, I'm looking at something um, that looks like a Fourier transform, so it's starting to look good. Uh, here I have something and I've got, well, these two exponentials, I can combine them, right? Uh, I can combine them and then it'll be e to the j minus j omega and then it'll be t plus tau. And I have t plus tau here, so uh, I'm going to be clever. I'm going to change it and I'm going to say z is equal to t plus tau. I just do a change of integrals. So I change the argument of integration, make it z, and of course it's minus infinity to infinity, so it's still minus infinity to infinity if I uh, uh, displace it a little. Uh, so now I've got two integrals, one that's only a function of t, one that's only a function of z. So they're double integral, but they're completely separable, so they become the product of two integrals. So a product of an integral in t, product times an integral in z, and each of these is the Fourier transform. So it's essentially the Fourier transform. The only thing that changes is the sign here, a negative or not. When there's not a negative sign, that means it's the um, complex conjugate of the Fourier transform. And where there is a minus, that means it's a Fourier transform. And so I have a complex conjugate times the original, and that just gives me the module squared. Oops, and that shows I forgot the square there. Sorry about that. Uh, so we can see that these two definitions are the same. So whether I just start with f of t and I say that e of omega is just taking the Fourier transform of 1 module squared, that gives one solution. And here, of course, I, I derive it from a definition of the autocorrelation function, but it gives the same thing. Of course, this factor of 2 pi is just a constant that can be defined in or out of the uh, power spectral density. Energy versus power. Now, I've kind of lacks and often use one instead of the other, but we'll take a little time to be a little more precise. So when I make mistakes later, you'll be able to correct it yourself by knowing the correct definition. So the definition of energy of a signal, uh, we can put it in terms of asymptotic definition. So I had before that it was minus infinity to infinity, but suppose that I put this as a limit process, so it's the limit as t goes to infinity, and I look at an interval around the origin that I'm making larger and larger and larger. 
So I go from minus t over 2 to t over 2, so something bracketing the origin, and I let that t go to infinity, and of course that is the energy. Now an energy signal by definition is one where this energy that I'm calculating is finite. Now what is the power function? The power function uh, is uh, defined as the limit of t goes to infinity of the same thing except I have a, a normalization here of 1 over t. Okay, this is the definition of power, average power. So the power here is 1 over t normalizes the interval uh, over which I'm, I'm calculating this. So if, as I let this limit goes to infinity, um, I get something which is finite, that means that when I'm going to have the exact same expression but I'm dividing by t, that's going to force this p to go to zero right, because t is going to infinity. This part is finite, but I have 1 over t. So that means that for any energy signal, the power, the average power, is, is 0. So what happens um, uh, in another situation? Suppose that I'm in the situation where the power is finite. Well, if the power is finite, that means this expression is, is OK when I have the 1 over t, but uh, if I take out this 1 over t, well, it must mean that I'm going to get something that blows up because I no longer have the 1 over t to keep it finite. Uh, so this is, uh, by definition, a, a power signal. So a power signal is one where the power is finite uh, but non-zero, and an energy signal is one where the energy is finite, but that means the power is zero. So one is an energy signal, one is a power signal. And... Um, all realistic signals are energy signals. All periodic signals are power signals. Now they're periodic, but of course th that assumes um, this integral, when I let it go to infinity, that means that oscillating has uh, infinite time and so the integral is going to uh, blow up. Um, but of course, when we look at periodic signals in the laboratory, we're not looking at it from minus infinity to infinity, and so their power is not infinite. Um, but uh, their energy is not infinite, sorry about that. So all realistic signals are energy signals, all periodic signals are power signals, and finally all random signals. Uh, when we look at the uh, mathematics to describe a random signal, they're going to have, they're going to be defined as power signals. So. Uh, this is the uh, structure that, that defines things, but um, it can get a little um, ambiguous at certain points. Here we're being very clear. Energy signals, power signals, uh, realistic signal, periodic signals, these we see all the time in Fourier analysis. So these are the two categories. And of course in communications uh, we often um, model our systems as having a random description. A stochastic description to the system. So this is uh, why we see power spectral density used in, in uh, communication systems. So let's have a quick look at periodic signals. So in periodic signals, of course, we would talk about a power spectral density instead of an energy spectral density. And to understand this, we'll look at the Fourier series representation of a periodic signal. So uh, Fourier theory tells us that whenever we have a periodic signal, there is a unique set of coefficients, the Fourier coefficient C of n, that allow us to write that um, periodic signal as a sum of um, complex exponentials, or equivalently as a sum of cosines and sines. So these Fourier coefficients, there's, they're unique. For any given uh, periodic signal, there's one set of coefficients, the Fourier coefficients, which gives us the Fourier series representation. Once we have these coefficients, now we can define the power spectral uh, density. And the power spectral density is essentially uh, these coefficients, and then we have a direct delta function on each one of the harmonics of the um, F0 which is the frequency of the periodic uh, signal. So periodic signal has what we call a discrete uh, power spectral density. In other words, there are not all frequencies which are present. The only frequencies that are present are related to the period, um, the um, period of the periodic signal. So there is the fundamental frequency of this periodic signal, f of zero, and then all the harmonics, all the multiples of these frequencies can be present but no other frequencies can be present. So only the multiples of the 
uh, fundamental. Only the harmonics are present. And each one could have a zero or non-zero coefficient, depending on uh, what, what is uh, the signal, periodic signal we're examining. So power spectral density, discrete. So now we'll look at the idea of autocorrelation function. How is it different, the same? Well, everything's really the same for the um, autocorrelation function. The only difference is we have this um, normalization over a single period. So for energy functions, the autocorrelation function was defined minus infinity to infinity. Now I have a periodic function. If I did that same minus infinity to infinity, it would blow up. So what I do instead is I define it over a single period. So from minus t0 over 2 to t0 over 2, and I normalize that uh, by this interval. Um, so other than that, the properties remain the same. It's symmetric about the origin. It takes its maximum at the origin. Uh, it has a power spectral density, which is defined by the Fourier transform pair. And of course, if I put uh, tau equal to zero here, I get the uh, average power of the signal. So we've talked about energy signals and power signals. All realistic signals are energy signals. All periodic signals are power signals. And the last thing I said was that all random signals are power signals. Now that's a big bite, and so we're going to take some time to discuss random signals. Uh, so that we can get to this understanding about the power spectral density of a random process.